Welcome to the Innovation Accelerator podcast, brought to you by Innovacer, the health cloud company. We're on a mission to connect and curate the world's healthcare information to make it accessible and useful. With Innovacer, everyone works in the service of patients like never before as one. Visit us online at innovacer.com. Welcome back to the Innovation Accelerator podcast. I'm your host, Steve Ambrose, Director of Content Marketing here at Innovacer. And today we're going to be talking about hard and soft healthcare with Gary Druckenmiller. Gary's a leader at Innovacer focused primarily on the provider solution segment. And more specifically, he heads up our team in the patient relationship management or PRM solution. It's a powerful component in our entire suite of solutions for providers and provider organizations. Plus, Gary's a maverick for empowering health consumers in today's healthcare system. So, Gary, I want to welcome you to the show. It is great to have you here. Thank you much, so much, Stephen. It's wonderful to be here, and it's a great topic that we're going to get into today. Look I'm forward. excited, too. Ready to go. So, I heard a quote once, Gary, that in your career, you play the game Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. But if you really want to get successful, it's what you do at nights and on the weekends that really matters. Mm. And so when I read that quote, what I interpret is it's all about the gaps. It's all about finding the gaps and finding the value and the results in those gaps. And I think that kind of would be a good segue into question, the first question here, which is going to be about hard and soft healthcare. And we've spoken about this a little bit off air, and I just find it very interesting how you frame hard healthcare and soft healthcare. And I would just really love for you to just jump into this and explain it a little bit more. Yeah, sure. That and a great phraseology at the end of the day. And of course, here at Innovator, your your commentary rings true because we don't sleep, right? <laughs> <laughs> there is, there is, there is no nighttime, there is no daytime. It's 24-7, you know, trying to change the world. Um, but it's actually kind of a it's an interesting um, context in relation to it actually has two answers, and I'll kind of break it down for you. Um, and it's and it's a measurement of kind of where we're at today versus where we could be if all things tick the right way in, let's say, the next two, three years. So hard healthcare today is the stuff that we know and love, right? And it's what we define as the classic kind of fee for service mentality that that is hard to do, all right? We've got amazing clinicians in market. You've got amazing structures that are in place that are there to take care of you in the fastest and most convenient way possible. This country has some of the top surgeons. People travel from around the world to come here. That's really hard, right? Like that's hard to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's one aspect of it being very hard. To deliver healthcare is incredibly difficult. Nobody does it better than in the US, like I'm a firm believer in that. But there's another aspect of that, which is the one that I think we t tend to dwell on a little bit more here, and that it is actually hard to engage in healthcare. So in the clinical arena, which for most of us, we hope narrow is a, is a kind of narrow window, right? We hope them don't ever enter it. Some of us do in a very you know, small way, others, it becomes kind of a, their life story and you end up seeing it on Facebook and it's amazing and hopefully the outcomes are great. But to get into that arena is hard. And then when you leave that arena, meaning the clinical arena, and for those that served you, it becomes hard because you don't really have anybody watching if you maintained that healthy outcome. Hmm. So the, the beginning of the journey and the end of the journey are hard things for people like us to do. And so then now this begins to transition into the, to the kind of the soft mindset. So there's two parts of that as well. The soft side of healthcare, as we generally have historically known it, is the stuff we do every day. I walk into CVS, I get a prescription. I've got my Apple Watch on, I go work out, I track my workout. Soft healthcare, the stuff that is now basically in the palm of our hands, we have easy access to these things, and they're, they're remedial in nature that we've, we've just, they've been almost bifurcated as part of our natural lives. Thank goodness. And again, greatest place in, place in the world in the US for being able to deliver that. But I come back to the hard piece and that beginning and end that I talked about needs to become soft. 
So how you get accessed into a health system, how you how they can, how they bring you in, how they onboard you, like the terms concierge come into play, and then how they stay connected to you for the rest of your life. That's the soft health care that providers absolutely are missing. They're not doing it. There's maybe a handful of systems in the country that are really talking about it well and starting to get into it. But outside of that, it's just a big old mess. And, and I think a good arena where the kind of PRM story comes into play is both sides of that fence. So that's kind of how I would articulate it at two different levels of kind of this hard, soft mindset. That's really interesting. And, and you know, you're in this space, you're constantly talking with provider organizations. And I'd love to pick your brain on this a little bit, Gary. Sure. When healthcare providers and, uh, and, and, and those in healthcare don't really get a good firm grip on the differences between hard healthcare, soft healthcare, what's the impact? I mean, what's the impact to patients? What's the impact to provider organizations when there isn't really a realization, as you mentioned, by most of the industry? Sure. Well, I, in these cases, it's very easy to use a personal story, right? Um, everybody's encountered this in one way or another. And I went in for some selective surgery back in August. Um, HIPAA requires me and PHI requires that I can't divulge the, <laughs> the details of it. <laughs> Although I probably would. I probably would if it wasn't that personal. Um, but um, so I had it. So I had to go in and I was trying to basic. I was trying to set an appointment, like something easy, something we take for granted. I can call my the people that cut my hair. And I can have an appointment literally in two seconds. I could probably even do it on their website, right? And they're, they're, they've got five employees that work there. But the local system that I was working with, trying to get an appointment with them, took me almost three months. Wow. Three months to get an appointment, right? And that's not the first time. I've had a few shoulder surgeries, same story. Just to get in, just to find time. Now, granted, we've got COVID going on. It's different, but I, there's a history I have this way before COVID because, um, you know, you're an athlete, I'm an athlete, we've had injuries, you know, we get in and out of things and, you know, you get hurt. And I've never had an easy entry into any health system in the greater New England area. And, and so that softness is, is where it, it hits home most. And then after that, I, you know, you get tossed around and, in terms of one department versus another, you get some people calling you with some information, you get two people calling you with another piece of information, so they're not talking. So it's all these little small intricacies that we take for granted in every other aspect of our life, but for some reason here, the softness, the human touch, the conversations, the comfortability of somebody embracing me at the most critical, one of the most critical moments of your life, your health, is in a negative state. So. I mean, just so that part alone, but then on the, on, the, on the flip side of it, if you go back to the other side, let's say I had a great clinical outcome and I'm leaving, I'm leaving the health system. I haven't had one person call to follow up with me after my surgery. Any, anybody, I mean, anybody call when you don't pay your bill? Well, <laughs> we're probably going to get to that. Of course they yeah. do. Right. Right. So that and that that and therein lies like another and I'll, I'll say that. But therein lies another part of that problem for the stuff that matters to them. They're all over you. But for the stuff that matters to you, it's persona non grata. Now, again, this isn't everybody, but it is systemic in nature and that we've COVID shaked, shook everybody out of apathy. It showed all of the accountabilities and gaps. That is that is why you see every health system in America basically like getting everybody in a room and duking it out and saying, what do we do? Like, what right. do we do? Yeah, it's really interesting. When I'm when you're talking about soft uh, health care and you're talking about I, to me, it really just sounds purely relational, like being able mm -hmm. to actually connect with people, not just inside the clinic and, and at the point of care, but outside. But to do it in a way that doesn't feel like, you know. Uh, we've got the white coats on and you're the patient. We say you right. do. And I think that's all starting to slowly break down on a lot of levels. And, and you and I are both big fans of consumerism, obviously. So mm. even in the next generation of, of patients as consumers, you know, some of that is certainly starting to change now. But I'm really, it's so interesting. There are just so many missed opportunities that I see provider organizations just falling into gaps on because they're not relational with their patients. I mean, I mean, how many patients drop off of care mm. because they're not being related to and, and being treated 
in a relationship. Maybe, maybe you could speak to that a little bit more as well, just the relational or relationship aspect. Yeah, and, and of course we have an, so many amazing examples of it. Again, we, we have to hearken back on current times and, and recent moments. And when we look at how I can buy a car out of a gumball machine. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like what? <laughs> like when did that happen? Um, and a, a dramatic example, of course, but the relation that that's a relationship that's built on one sim, one term, and I just gave it away. Simplicity. How do we make this very troubling time? Having surgery, having treatment, it's it's hard. There's anxiety. People people put off surgeries because. For, it thinks about somebody getting bariatric surgery or lap band surgery, right? These are big moments for somebody who's been diagnosed as chronically more obese, um, um, obese, excuse me, and they and they know that they're in, that they know what their options are: diet and eating and exercise, or potentially surgery. Bariatric patients are noted for putting off their decision for months leading into it. What are they thinking? In that moment, a relationship should be built. And it's maybe not the physical one just yet, yet, but it's the onboarding one of how can we help you? Are you dealing with the stress? Would you like to talk to somebody? Um, what is your what is your behavioral mental state? And asking these questions to to make this entry into it easy. Most systems, again, don't do this very well, and it begins to hearken to this notion of the journey, and in, in the in a historical provider state, which is which is you know. The, the, the more the more current interpretation of that is really about maybe 30 to 40 years old since technology really started ramping up since new treatments started coming in and it really became about the brand of the physician right that we got away from those relations you know you know you got away from your local community doctor you got away away from these things because it became so narrowed and focused on we're the best health system in America, we're number one. And so that the whole relational notion of the journey just kind of obliterated. So we got to get back to that. And, 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 the, and if, if, we can, if we can begin to talk about the journey as it relates to relations, things become a lot clearer in terms of where some of those gaps are. They're mostly, mostly mental, they're mostly behavioral. And, and, a, and a lot of times it just comes down to an individual's ability to make some of these keen decisions on their own or with the help of others. Yeah. And you said it with the help of others, just genuine empowerment, mm -hmm. um, you know, of the, of the patient. Of course. Um, I want to, I want to switch over to something here. This is a, something that I found online that I really wanted to touch on here in, in our conversation. Mm -hmm. So in December, 2021, the Kaiser family foundation came out with a poll, very surprising. The, the statistics are pretty eye-opening. Half of U.S. adults today have put off or skipped some sort of medical care because of the cost. And if we keep going yep. down the line, something like almost 60% of African-American and Hispanic adults report delaying or skipping at least one type of medical care due to cost. We start breaking it down. We're looking a little at, at health equity here. 47% of those covered by health insurance are reporting they have difficulty affording their out-of-pocket costs. And this one I was particularly surprised by is a 2021 study by Debt.com showed that 50%, half of all American adults now carry some form of medical debt with mm. half of those owing more than $1,000. Mm. I mean, it's, it's amazing when you think about it. And so, what I want to get into here, Gary, is financial experience. And I've said this before, and I'd love to get your take on it, that when we talk about patient experience, somehow, some way, we seem to be sort of not including financial experience in the totality of patient experience, almost like patient experience is clinical and financial experience is, well, something wholly separate. Hmm. I'd like to, to ask you, in the in the scheme maybe of bringing data together and 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 what you do on the PRM uh, solution side at Innovacer, give me your thoughts on maybe bringing the financial aspects of healthcare into the wholeness of of the patient record, the patient experience, and, and all sure. of that. Sure. 
uh, there's a phrase that I used to use um, for a while and uh, it was a question, like, in, like most brands these days, they ask questions and it was, are you commerce ready? <laughs> or are you or are you are you transaction ready? And there was a purpose to exactly the question you're asking. Um, when the, most EMRs, as, as great as they are in terms of managing medical records, their second distinct purpose is to collect money. That's it, right? Now they have some help. They have what are defined as revenue cycle management systems. The problem with those is that many of those were built um, a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> and they don't operate under today's standards or cloud standards. And, and you bring up a great point. They definitely haven't done a very good job of tapping into the data model of a provider and the data cost structure and cash flow system of a provider, which also means it's, it's somewhat linked to a payer is incredibly complicated, right? So when we look at when somebody gets that bill and it says you owe $10,000 and then somewhere down right below that is this is not a bill, right? Like, why do I even get that? Why do I even get that? No wonder, no wonder people are freaking out, right? Plus the, the other, then that's on the back end. What about on the front end? What about a cost estimate? Does, do people even get cost estimates? M most cases they don't. Most people don't, and, and, and a lot of when you talk about equity, that's even another layer. Most in, in certain kind of paradigms aren't used, I mean, average consumer isn't used to kind of getting in and out of a health system and, and dealing with the cost structures. Most, would, you, you would think, have the it's advantage or disadvantage of not seeing the intricacy of a provider and payer relationship at this high cost level. And then when they do, how do they figure it all out? It's, 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 you need an abacus, right? So that whole arena has, has, has displaced the positive connotations of some amazing potentials of healing and caring, again, and especially in this country. And they have dislodged that notion because of the exact fears that, you're, that you've identified. I don't think, and that says, I don't think I can afford this, or I'm not sure my payer, my provider, or my healthcare insurance will cover it. And if they do, I'm not sure how to articulate that to them. I don't know what papers to bring. I don't, I don't know what questions to ask. And all of a sudden you get into this cycle. And, and I won't even mention the fact that most of the costs, as we certainly know, are exorbitant, right? Now, I, for somebody who goes in for heart surgery and, and the highly complex cases, I will give it, I'll give a little credence there, right? These are complicated things, but that, that, that's, that doesn't cascade down to simplistic things. Simplistic things are still too cost heavy. They're far too intricate to understand. And the systems that are supporting them do not do a good job of articulating them in a relational way, tapping into that data. So to your, to your, uh, question, initial question, and then I'll, I'll bring it back to you. It is the, one of the most important parts. Like if the, if the journey is this long, that revenue conversation should be starting right here and it should end right about in here. There's two major points of investigation and discovery and then finalization. And they are communicated as poorly as everything that comes before and after them. And, and, and that is put a disdain on the US healthcare system just in terms of as you identified. I'm just not gonna do it. I'm gonna put it off. I'm gonna see if I can get it done myself or I'm gonna do some other kind of wacky method of healing because I just don't think I wanna get into debt or, or for whatever other reason. And uh, yeah, exactly. And, and that's the behavior on the patient's end. Mm -hmm. And then you couple that in with the fact of does the doctor or does the health system even know that the patient's feeling that way relationally? And then do gaps start to open up? Do right. patients become inactive, yep. right? Do chronic diseases mm -hmm. somehow now start the coordination of care and the follow through? And that, does that start to drop off? And then what does yep. that mean to costs? So I maybe mean, they only get, maybe they only get partially down the journey and then they start freaking out and then they dislodge there. I mean, so many areas. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I want to talk a little bit about what you do. Uh, at Innovacer, and specifically around the PRM solution. Mm -hmm. And some people might look at that initially and say, oh, it's a play on words, PRM, CRM. But but truly, um, I know that in looking at it and in better understanding it myself, you know, there are some critical differences. And 
I guess what I'd like to do first is I'd like to start by asking you about that. When you look at those two, the PRM and the CRM, how do you see them comparing to one another? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the CRM term has been around since the, the late 90s. Um, and many of the large software companies today, for when they first started kind of utilizing it, like SAP and, and Oracle, and then eventually, obviously, Salesforce. But it's manifested over time. You're absolutely right. Um, the, we use a different term to dislodge from the historical brand of CRM in the provider space, which for the last 10 years has been a waxing and waning institution of ups and downs and mostly downs. Hmm. And the big question is, is, is why, right? So I came from that world and I was part of many discussions with many health systems in the country and we did a lot of amazing stuff. But the one thing we couldn't figure out and that because nobody had tried to figure it out, well, I shouldn't say that. Many were trying, but they couldn't resolve it due to the complexity, all the things we've talked about, is the provider data model. And, the per, and there's a lot of data in a health system, and not all of it is pertinent to a consumer or a patient, right? In fact, a fair amount of it isn't. But the stuff that is, the stuff that rallies up to micro little moments in a journey, action here goes to action here, and then this gets crossed over to this department, and then goes in reverse back to this department for processing and all of that. That's all consumer-centric. That's all patient-centric. Nobody up until recently has been able to figure out the data model and rationalize it in a way that makes that information accessible and consistent and reliable. That is the break that, we are, that we're literally going through right now. And so the term PRM is meant to separate us from that, from that history of, of every time you needed to create a data model for a health system, you literally were piecing it together with duct tape, glue, and, and, and wire. Right? It had to be custom built every time. Imagine building a custom data model for every health system in America. Like, no wonder it didn't work right? You need, you need a standard. Um, so here we have the standard, right? And so we're trying to brand it and separate, separate from that. Um, and then the last aspect of it is, is then, okay, well, then what do you do with it? Is it still kind of a marketing thing, which most CRMs are, they're mostly marketing centric, a lot of CMOs, a lot of chief communication officers, a little bit of digital transformation. No, let's do it the whole way. The PRM it's not just the consumer. So if you look at an entire journey, it's broken down into three primary experiences, consumer, clinical, and pop health. Most CRMs, classic CRMs, start and end at the beginning and end of consumer. PRM extends that olive branch deep into the clinical workflow, deep into the population workflow, and then keeps it going for life. That is the next arena that we're getting into. And only, only a system that can resolve to a hardened like neutron star data model that is built only for health systems or only for a payer can do this. Outside of that, you have, you have a, you're pulling together four or five different you know, data management solutions and who, who are not used to working together very well and, and, and cobbling it together at the cost of millions and millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, I think in some ways too, from what I'm hearing you say that PRM in many ways, apart from being a solution, is and can be and probably already is a, a driver. Once you start using it and you recognize how the pieces come together and, yeah. you know, all of a sudden processes may start to change in the provider organization. We may start developing a new system here or there we didn't have before because now we're looking at this framing it around the patient with mm -hmm. a PRM versus, you know, we try to take something, as you say, and cobble it in, try to you know, try to make it fit what we have here. Have you heard that from, from providers that are using, you know, the PRM solution, Gary? Have you heard that, you know, they're changing some of their processes and, yeah. and some of their training maybe? Yeah, it's such, it's such an amazing point. And it, honestly, that's one thing that doesn't get talked about enough. You, you're so used to doing it this way. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a saying on a, and it's written on a wall and it gets passed around the internet every now and then. I saw it actually again a couple of days ago. It's like the, the oldest saying or something like that, uh, the oldest saying or the, the, the most common saying that people say is I've always done it this way. So it's something like that, right? I've always done it this way. Well, that's like normal talk in the Nor uh, North American <laughs> health system, right? <laughs> and for folks like us, and we've, we've walked in and out of these doors several times, 
that's a very common term from somebody in the administration or somebody in operations or somebody in some sort of process management or workflow management. And it's not their fault. It's not their fault. It's, it's how the organization tries to improve itself. How, again, with the exception of the clinical arena, which is that hard area, they, most health systems do a really bang up job at that. Let's just call that for what it is. It's the surrounding competencies. Why aren't you looking at the soft side? Why aren't you looking at these, this collection of five processes and saying, do all of those work as well as they should? Or with each one of them, is it is there a 2.0? Heck, is there a 5.0 version that you want to jump to <laughs> by, vir by virtue of having this information now available and it's showing you something entirely new that you never even saw before? Why wouldn't you go after that and change that too? And again, only can be done if you have a ratified data model that exposes this in a way that they're not used to. And that's the breaking point. They have to start to see it to believe it. And it's literally under, this is literally happening right now. It's right under our feet. So it's, it's hard to walk and run and build all the stuff at the same time. But if we just stop and kind of look around, there's a lot of new amazing stuff out there, which to exactly your point, not only, not only kind of puts a constitution around a hardened data-centric approach, but now immediately allows you to look how you do everything for the past 40 years and change it. Yeah. And, you know, we started the show and, and our conversation around gaps, gaps mm -hmm. that lead into results where you're finding the value, that sort of thing. And that's really where I think we're coming to now as well is not just gaps in terms of, you know, what's happening on the patient records, what's missing from the patient records that needs to be brought together. But as we're seeing here through it, it, as well, gaps in the fact that you know, we've got systems, we've got policies, we've got procedures that are not lining up on that soft side. So mm. really interesting, Gary. I, I want to end our, our talk today with this last question. In 30 seconds or less, I'd like to have you give some final parting thoughts, if you could, uh, to us about, you know, hard health care and soft health care. Sure. I, I think the biggest statement to make um, is spend less time focusing on the the thing that you're you're already doing really well at right just take off the blinders and look left and look right and just for and pick one journey pick pick cardiology pick orthopedics pick screening something relatively maybe even self-selective and straightforward that that the average person in america kind of does every day in some kind of fashion and just map it map the soft side of the journey from first point of contact into the administration and to access as it transitions into clinical. Bypass clinical and then see how they exit the system and map that too. You will be alarmed at what you find and it's not gonna be very good. Most of it's, and most of it's gonna be pretty poor. And, but you have, to, you have to map it to see it and then do something about it. That's probably the best way to elevate the soft side so it matches up to the hard side. <laughs> Gary Druckenmiller, a privilege, a pleasure. Great having you on uh, the Innovation Accelerator podcast. And I just wanted to uh, thank you for your time. It's been great chatting with you. And I am certainly looking forward to having you on again. My pleasure, Steve. Thank you. Our thanks to Gary Druckenmiller for taking his time to chat with us today about hard health care and soft health care. And for our listeners, don't forget to check the show notes for links to resources and contact information related to today's show. Also, stay tuned to the Innovator podcast for more shows covering the healthcare IT topics that you care about. For more information on this and other healthcare IT topics, please visit Innovator.com. I'm Steve Ambrose, wishing you a great result for your day. You've been listening to the Innovation Accelerator podcast, brought to you by Innovator, the health cloud company. Don't forget to check the show notes for links to related resources and other information. And stay tuned to the Innovation Accelerator podcast for more programs about the healthcare IT topics you care about. Accelerate your transformation and build the future of health on the Innovator Health Cloud. For more information, please visit innovator.com.